Good afternoon. Um, I'm Jen Higgins. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs for Garden Health. Thank you for the opportunity to present in today's dialogue. Um, as early detection becomes a new frontier of cancer care, um, companies like Garden are focused on becoming, on collaborating with organizations like Prevent Cancer to increase awareness of ongoing research that will drive patient-friendly screening solutions. I'm excited to be joined today by our co-founder and CEO, Dr. Helmi Tuki, as well as our Vice President for Outcomes and Evidence, Dr. Katherine Lang, for today's fireside chat on the future of blood-based cancer screening. But first, let's take a moment for a short video to learn more about Garden Health and how we're harnessing the power of blood to change the trajectory of cancer and making advances that move us closer to a blood test that screens for cancer. Jasmine, would you mind playing the video? Blood, it has the power to sustain life. In the fight against cancer, it holds something more. Hidden deep within is a code written in telltale fragments of circulating tumor DNA. Gardent is at the forefront of deciphering that code with technology that is revealing crucial insights and making advances that move us closer to a blood test that screens for cancer. Gardent is forging a systematic path forward, starting with advanced cancer where the signals are strongest, progressively making breakthroughs that are fueling a deep understanding of the disease. For advanced cancer patients, Gardent 360 unlocks genomic signals from tumor DNA fragments shed into the blood, revealing critical information to help identify more effective treatments. Numerous clinical studies demonstrate its power to overcome the challenges associated with traditional tissue biopsies. Garden 360 is becoming the standard of care in non-small cell lung cancer and increasingly being used to guide treatment across all late-stage solid cancers. Additionally, with every blood sample sequenced, over 100,000 and counting, real-world experience and vast data sets are being generated, fueling product enhancements and accelerating progress towards the early detection of cancer. The company's highly sensitive lunar technology is uncovering once hidden signals in the blood that reveal early signs of cancer. Through its Lunar One program, Garden is applying multidimensional analysis to screen for residual or recurrent disease in cancer survivors and identify early stage patients who may be cured by new therapies and development. With its Lunar Two program, Garden is poised to delve even deeper. After having demonstrated high sensitivity and specificity with its Lunar 2 assay, Gardent has initiated the 10,000 patient ECLIPSE trial for the early detection of colorectal cancer in asymptomatic patients. If successful, this first step will form the backbone of its early cancer detection program. The Lunar 2 blood test overcomes barriers associated with the current testing method, which could dramatically improve cancer screening rates and potentially save countless lives. Each day, Garden is proving that blood can change the trajectory of the fight against cancer. With its uniquely innovative and systematic approach, Garden is harnessing the power of blood to advance its mission of conquering cancer with data. Thank you, Jasmine, um, and thanks to our panelists for participating in this. Um, Helmi, now that the audience knows a bit more about Garden, um, can you tell us a little bit more about that putting the patient first and what motivates you to take on this exciting challenge in the cancer space? Yeah, so we started the company about eight years ago and uh, it was really came out of a frustration for how slow some of the progress was at the time in the um, oncology space. and. You know, while, you know, there's a lot of great uh, research and obviously a lot of great advancements, what we felt was there was a, really a lack of data. That healthcare in general is very data starved. And if we could unleash 10x more data, 100x more data, we could essentially increase the rate of progress uh, in the field uh, collectively. And so that was really the, the idea behind really uh, powering and enabling liquid biopsy technology in the oncology space. Um, Putting patients first is clearly one of the central tenets we have. You're thinking about the patient's experience, putting ourselves in their shoes, and um, really imagining you know, how we would feel in, in, in their place. The second tenant we have at Garden, though, is intellectual humility. And so while our eventual goal and you know, the premise was, you know, how do we enable a simple blood test at an annual physical to detect cancer early? we felt that uh, there was a lot more data needed to be able to get to that eventual uh, promised land. And to do that, um, we essentially launched uh, a test for late stage patients in 
2014 was the first comprehensive liquid biopsy uh, to match uh, advanced cancer patients, stage three, stage four patients with the most effective treatments without the need for a tissue biopsy. And so if you think about you know, what that enabled, it enabled us to essentially see what cancer looks like in the blood, um, see that at scale now over 150,000 patients that we've tested over 50 different cancer types. And that data has served as our compass by which uh, it leads us down the techn technological roadmap to better performance, better sensitivity, better specificity to detecting cancer uh, earlier and earlier. And uh, that, that roadmap has uh, enabled really the launching of our Eclipse trial uh, in uh, Q4 of last year. That's our first uh, foray into early detection. Uh, we're starting with colorectal cancer screening. And uh, it's something that's very exciting. We believe a high performance blood-based test will serve uh, a lot of unmet need that exists from a compliance point of view with some of the available colonoscopy or uh, stool-based methods that are, that are out there. And, um, you know, it's really been the data, the experience, our experience with working with physicians in terms of the practical realities of workflow that has gotten us to this point and hopefully to a uh, culmination, uh, fruition of the initial vision we had eight years ago. It's an exciting landscape to be a part of and to have the spectrum of cancer care um, from advanced cancer to those who are not yet facing cancer, I think is really, really impressive and very exciting. I, I'd like to talk more about that. I think we did a pre-survey of some of the audience attendees to talk a bit more about uh, the environment and some of their challenges in this space. And we, you know, we found in our survey that two thirds of the audience had never had a colonoscopy. Now, I didn't pull the audience to ask how old they are, so we may just have a very young audience um, in front of us. But you know, what we do know is that nearly one in three Americans aren't up to date with their screening. Um, I'd be curious, Dr. Lang, what do we know about the barriers to, to colorectal cancer screening? Thanks, Jen, and, and thank everybody for having us here today. Um, <clears throat> What we know about the barriers are that they're incredibly multifactorial, that um, the opportunity for screening somebody in the colorectal cancer space actually does not come around that often. Um, the letter that we get at our 50th birthday that invites us to a colonoscopy is something that most doctors know about, but do find that it is laborious, time consuming, and largely um, find that they have to do it opportunistically as much as possible. So you go in with a cold and somebody will offer you some form of screening. We did do some work around this because we're very interested in how bringing the test closer to the doctor and to that doctor patient interaction. So the opportunity to actually test in an office, which colonoscopy or stool based testing doesn't allow, how would that change the interaction? And so we actually did two meta analyses and you're gonna share the screen now. So we looked at literature about why a doctor believes that there, is, uh, there are barriers to colorectal cancer screening and why patients believe it. And unsurprisingly, um, we find that there's a disparity between what a doctor believes and what a patient believes. And actually, when healthy individuals are asked why they aren't screened, they think that it's a lack of a doctor actually telling them about the screening. The lack of awareness is something that I think is becoming something that we're addressing. There are multiple different pushes to try and get people aware that this is a disease we can screen for. And if we're screened for it, then we can reduce the risk of dying from colorectal cancer. There are still barriers like cost that patients see. And there's a really interesting study from UCLA, which showed that most patients actually find that it's that time difference between being offered screening and then actually undergoing colonoscopy, which is incredibly detrimental. If your main, I, if your main worries are going to work and looking after your kids, waiting six, eight weeks to actually get an appointment for colonoscopy is not really um, con concordant with lifestyle. When we talked to primary care providers and when we actually did this meta-analysis, both of which have been presented internationally, what we actually found was that it's largely that the provider feels that they are making an assessment of their patient, which is very, very important. One must decide for the patient what is appropriate to offer. And then this issue of access and cost. However, those two things do throw something up. The provider is making an assessment and the patient feels they are not being offered. And so actually for, for us to get to an, a, a place where more people are screened and we get to that that huge goal of trying to get the whole population screened 
we actually have to get doctors and patients to sh make shared decisions together. And having a test in hand, like blood-based testing, perhaps would bridge that gap that we see right now. But this is an incredibly important dichotomy and we have to try and support it. And the technology we bring can take us so far, but trying to improve the ability of a doctor to screen opportunistically when somebody is in their office would potentially be a game changer. Um, I can also imagine that this is uh, more acute for certain populations, um, the challenges of getting access to screening, uh, particularly through colonoscopy. Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of um, how some people are more advantaged or better positioned to be able to either A, a have this conversation with their primary care doctor or B, be able to access screening easily? Yeah, I think health literacy in this space is is dichotomous as well. There are people that completely understand the need for colonoscopy, there are family members who've undergone it and they talk about it. And then there are people who really don't think about their health like that. It's really interesting, I think, as a physician to watch what's happened through COVID and understand that people are starting to really think much more about health and about testing and about and becoming a little bit more health aware and health literate. And I do wonder how those conversations will go in the future, especially as we've started to understand testing on this massive scale that's unprecedented in history. But I do think that um, to be able to understand what it is that you're undergoing and to be appropriately counseled is incredibly important for everybody. And that disparity is something that companies like Garden and certainly with the help of advocacy groups, we can try and bridge that gap a little bit more and make people understand that the best test is the one that gets done. And so just talking about testing is not enough. We have to get people screened. Absolutely. Um, Helmi, you alluded to this um, in your earlier remarks, but I know that Garden recently uh, presented some uh, pretty compelling data at AACR this week um, with regards to your Lunar 2 assay. Could you talk a little bit about that and sort of the excitement around where things go with the Eclipse trial? Yeah, so we uh, presented uh, data from uh, additional cohorts of uh, cancer patients and healthy controls. Uh, we had presented data last year at uh, AACR that demonstrated nearly 90% sensitivity with 94% specificity. This was a new independent cohort We've made some improvements on the epigenomic side of our bioinformatics scholar as well. And what we saw is, you know, when we used a more accurate cohort of healthy controls, these were colonoscopy screen negatives, um, the specificity improved even further. So we saw about 90% sensitivity um, in 113 cancer patients and um, about 99% uh, specificity with this data. So it's obviously it bodes very well for our Eclipse trial, and uh, we're very hopeful that, you know, as we continue to enroll and we get towards the finish line, that um, we'll have a test that, uh, you know, passes the bar. And more than that, you know, is a high performance blood test that will uh, essentially address some of the unmet need that exists from a compliance point of view that Catherine uh, mentioned. Uh, it's, you know, we just think that there's so many uh, implications to you know taking time out of you know a work week you know a couple of days doing the prep doing a colonoscopy and so if you think about even kind of socioeconomically you know just the types of individuals that can take time off of work and actually get screened um, and you know the promise of having a blood-based you know, high performance you know test i think is uh is really going to make a big difference in the space and hopefully get the field to the 80% compliance goal that uh, has been uh, has been out there and uh, hard to reach for so many years. Catherine, is there anything you'd like to add about the Eclipse trial um, and where things stand and where you see um, the future in terms of timing and next steps? Eclipse is, is sort of an extraordinary trial. I mean, it's probably one of the biggest trials in the world right now. Um, we're looking for 10,000 subjects in the US who are undergoing colonoscopy as part of their routine care. We are then taking some blood for um, the lunar assay and we'll be comparing against the outcome of the colonoscopy. So we expect to be able to read that out next year. We're doing very well in recruitment, even despite COVID. We've tried very hard to be very patient centric, even from the beginning before COVID was even a dot on the horizon. And we have things like mobile phlebotomy. We have um, a lot of coverage in rural areas. We have e-consent, which allows for people to be consented without actually having to make a trip to the doctors. And so we've continued to enroll throughout COVID. And I think what's really interesting and exciting is, is we've watched colonoscopy rates 
really crash. And we've seen the recent data that suggests that about 10,000 colorectal and breast cancers are going to be missed. And I think it really hammers home why we're even putting all of this effort into demonstrating the value of this technology. It's because during COVID, we've seen as the world shuts down, screening is something that has dropped off the table and giving people the opportunity to be screened and even to participate in clinical trials throughout COVID has been something that we've really, really focused on and, and tried to make sure that we have as broad a spectrum as possible. A little bit to Helmi's point and some data that you'll see probably in a year or so's time once we recruit, um, we are very interested in what the economic cost to an individual and then to a larger society is of undergoing invasive screening. It's not normal throughout the sort of developed world. If you looked at the UK, Canada and Australia, they are not, they don't use colonoscopy as a primary screening modality, whether that be right or wrong. But there's definitely an economic cost to taking two days out of work to have your prep and then have an anesthesia and a procedure. And so we are collecting data from every patient who goes into Eclipse to find out what the impact on work, productivity and home life is of actually having those two days of, of preparation and procedure. And I think that will be really interesting to try and understand perhaps even more so why we are struggling to get the number above two thirds of a screened population. You made a really great point. I think, you know, patients are becoming more educated and informed, you know, but doctors often don't have enough time to spend with their patients to walk through all of those options and choices. And I think that, you know, I would assume that this is an immutable, but, you know, patient education becomes so important as part of that conversation around colorectal cancer screening, especially as more options that are frankly more accessible become available over time. Yeah, and, and as developers of tests and as trialists ourselves, um, organizations um, like this one can help us to really understand where those barriers are and develop evidence or develop methodologies that will help to drive screening forward. And I think that that's not something we can do on our own. And it's, it's wonderful to be with Prevent Cancer and to, to learn some of the things that you've learned over the years, which we could take forward as we try and revolutionize to some extent colorectal cancer screening. It's, it's very exciting what, what Garden is trying to do here. Absolutely. I think that that's where I kind of wanted to go next in terms of the technology. You know, Helmi, as you know, the landscape for blood-based cancer screening is evolving very rapidly. There are a number of companies in the space and their tests under development that target a single cancer like Lunar 2, but also ones that target multiple cancers. You know, what do we know about these universal cancer tests, which I'm sure a lot of folks in the audience have heard about, um, and maybe talk a little bit about why we've chosen colorectal cancer, but also sort of from a patient perspective, you know, how should we look at these universal tests and what they mean and why are they different? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So our methodology, just as a company, has always been following the path of maximal clinical utility. So thinking about, you know, where can we make the most impact most quickly in terms of actually changing clinical workflows? It's, it's more than just the technology. It's how does that technology and how does the clinical evidence that supports it you know, how does it eventually make an impact in terms of changing clinical workflows, having decision impact, and bending mortality curves, you know, from the, from the disease or changing outcomes. And, and so, you know, what we did with Garden360 was we started with lung cancer, even though the test and the technology that we currently use is used in 50 different types of solid tumors and is, is fairly universal. We started uh, creating and, and uh, generating evidence in lung cancer where there was the maximal clinical utility in terms of a uh, number of biomarkers, biomarker driven therapies and so on. And what that created was, it created a mountain of evidence, it created positive user experience and it, it created really a uh, drive or a f it fueled adoption of the technology in oncology offices. And guess what, you know, all those physicians and oncologists, they not only treat lung cancer, but they treat every other solid tumor as well. And so once, um, you know, that, we had that beachhead, it was very easy to expand to you know, many other solid tumors. And now we have Medicare coverage across almost all solid tumor cancers and the test is being used in, as I said, uh, dozens of, of cancer types. Similarly, in early uh, detection, it's even more challenging to get to high compliance and integrate with the system. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of primary care physicians. Um, but even more so, the downstream implications of uh, test uh, in the early detection setting um, can have 
you know, enormous consequences. If you think about mm -hmm. what are the downstream implications of a false positive of a test? What is the diagnostic and interventional odyssey that's going to be unleashed from that false positive down the road? And what are the health ec you know, economic uh, implications? Is there going to be a net health um, benefit from a population point of view? And so all of those things have to be considered. And each one we believe is very nuanced and um, very different from indication to indication, because you also have to look at, you know, what's the existing screening uh, methodology in each one of those? What's the performance of that? Um, how is that used? And so for colorectal, all of those things lined up perfectly in terms of thinking about the catchment that exists with colonoscopy. And it's been very well studied in terms of, you know, what the adverse event uh, uh, ratio is and uh, you know, percentages of, of that procedure, what the you know health economic and you know health implications are of that, and so it's really a perfect storm where everything kind of lines up, and then you know we we truly believe that for a physician to really replace an existing screening methodology with something else that whether it's universal or multi-cancer or a single cancer, you're going to have to show evidence um, head to head that, you know, that screening, that new screening tool um, is worthwhile in terms of really putting aside something that has been uh, standard of care for so many years for this new tool, and then really understand what the positive implications of that. It's not just enough to detect cancer early. I think, you know, there's a, I think that's often conflated, the fact that detecting an early cancer is not necessarily an end result in and of itself. You have to show that you know detecting that cancer and the following intervention actually made makes a difference or would make a difference in terms of the outcomes of that patient. And you know I think with colorectal, a lot of that data is already there, and we can piggyback against you know comparing with colonoscopy. For other cancer types, it's not so clear, frankly. And you may need a study like the National Lung Screening Study, which was a 10-year study, and you know basically uh, where they where the endpoint was mortality. Um, so it's, it really is an indication by indication question in my point of view. No, I completely agree. I think that's a great point. Uh, Catherine, I'd love to get back to your comments about COVID in terms of sort of the future of cancer screening. You mentioned some of the things that Garden had done to really look at um, how to adapt in this environment. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, some of the concerns that people have about the implications of COVID-19 on long-term screening, how easy it will be? to get colonoscopies and what this means for a potential blood-based uh, cancer screening option? Because it seems as though it presents obvious opportunities um, for something like this to take shape faster in this new landscape that we're in. I think you're right. Um, one of the sort of challenging things I think we're gonna face as the world opens up again is without really worrying about the, the sort of second wave and, and everything closing down is that the backlogs are just getting longer and longer. And we've already talked about the fact that patients find that delay between offer of screening and actual intervention to be something that's quite detrimental to them actually undergoing their screening. And so we think there's about a million backlogged colonoscopies right now. And so in, in a system that had a little bit of extra capacity, but that capacity was quickly being filled by the 45 to 50 year old recommendation, which ACS came out with, um, we now have a bottleneck, which is going to dissuade people from screening. And I think one of the concerns people have in screening in environments is when somebody is dissuaded from screening or falls out of the funnel, it's very difficult and challenging to get them back in. And so the opportunity for, I, I, I hesitate with non-invasive, a blood test is very minimally invasive and very well received by most people. Um, those kinds of tests are the sort of test that we can do opportunistically when somebody comes in with their symptoms, we can do it in the doctor's office um, and then have the screening done. Um, that also has a downstream effect on colonoscopy because any non-invasive test, be it stool or blood, must be followed up by the definitive intervention. And the opportunity to create some sort of more, more comprehensive triage mechanism, screen as many people as possible and triage the highest risk people who come up positive would be very, very beneficial to a system that's already under a significant amount of strain. And I think that COVID has taught us that we cannot simply accept that the status quo will stay the same forever. Sure, and I think there's a, there's a level of anxiety amongst folks about 
um, entering healthcare facilities and thinking about that landscape. And so I think the fact that we have options that allow for that mobile phlebotomy and other things that you mentioned are become increasingly critical for people to maintain that continuity of care when we think about something like an annual exam and we want to get to that place. And remember, um, there's a disproportionate ahead. effect as well on women of working age with children, of people of color, people at lower socioeconomic groups. And so my big belief that technology can bring is access and access for people to access things that should not simply be for people who could quite happily take two days off work and work remotely. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's the people who stack our shelves and, and have to go to work every day and be in um, manufacturing plants, those people who we've seen have to still go out to work, we've seen this disparity grow even more through COVID. And it should draw into stark relief the fact that not all screening methodologies are created equally for these people. I think we've all had personal stories of, you know, the challenges of taking a couple of days off work or consuming the prep or getting the referral or scheduling the appointment with the GI pick you up for the hospital, all the things that we have to think about that, you know, could really be minimized, if not eliminated by a blood based option, um, simply in a primary care setting. So I mean, that's what makes it really exciting. You know, in our pre survey, you know, 85% of the audience had mentioned that they had never participated in a clinical trial before. Um, you know, the American Cancer Society recently uh, came out with a statement and acknowledged that most patients express a willingness to want to be a part of clinical research, but only a small fraction of them ultimately end up enrolling in a trial due to barriers that make it difficult to participate. You know, I, right now I'd like to, what I'd like to do is dig a little bit deeper on the answer to that question and try to better understand what motivates healthy people to participate in a clinical trial. I was wondering if uh, Jasmine, if you wouldn't mind putting up that quick poll question and see if we could get a few answers um, in our last few minutes of our discussion. Yeah, and I think um, any, anybody with an interest in screening who comes from a patient advocacy point of view could really help us here. As developers of tests and as trialists, we're always looking to improve what we do. And what we're really looking for are any sort of insights that anybody might have about how do we encourage people to undergo screening, but um, how to also participate in clinical trials. And I do genuinely believe that the, the post-COVID world will create a lot more health literacy and citizen scientists who actually understand that the altruism of clinical research can change the future. And I, I do believe that that's something that um, we all should try and support here. And anything that you can give us insights into, we will do our darndest to include it in Eclipse and make sure we're even more representative than we believe we already are. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, Jasmine, are we able to get some answers to that poll? Um, while we're here. I know I didn't give folks a lot of time. It's a lot of words on the screen, but it would be great for us to get some feedback now. Yes. Uh, as a reminder to the attendees, the poll is at the bottom of your screen and you must click into it. So that being said, we'll come back to the results in a few minutes, but I think what you know, help me, I think back to sort of this different population that, you know, Garden currently works with in the advanced cancer space. They're different because we're looking at a population now that is healthy. These are not people that have stage three or stage four cancer who, you know, are not going to the doctor all the time, maybe getting their annual checkup, but really probably have a more limited interaction with the healthcare system. Um, I, I'm curious, you know, and Catherine raised this earlier, but I, I think one of the big questions is, you know, how do we get healthy people to view their cancer screening like an annual dental checkup? Is that really the goal here with Lunar 2 is to have it be as, as seamless for the patient as possible and to get them to understand the value of it in a way that doesn't necessarily inconvenience them, but gives them a priority that this is important to them going forward and it can be easy to do? Yeah, I mean, I think that's clearly the case here. I think in terms of what Catherine has already said, you know, having something that is this opportunistic screening modality where, you know, let's say I'm in for my annual physical, a flag comes up in the EMR saying, you know, out of date for uh, colorectal you know, screening. If you can put everything in the physician's control, you know, where there's no patient participation, um, you know, we know Weight Watchers and all these things don't work very well whenever there's a there's an individual uh, compliance or participation um, portion to it. But ever, if everything is really done where the additional screening test or the blood test is just tacked on to the labs that are ordered by the physician anyway, your vitamin D and your CBC and your lipid panel, and here's a 
garden lunar two test for colorectal screening to bring you back into uh, compliance. That I think is just fundamentally paradigm, a fundamental paradigm shift in terms of how screening is done today, um, at least for colorectal cancer. And we think it's something that um, is gonna be fundamentally important and critical to getting uh, this country where it needs to be from uh, uh, combating colorectal cancer and incidence of colorectal cancer. You know, the way I said it, and I think Catherine alluded to, is that, you know, the 30% of Americans who aren't screened, you know, they're getting tested, they're getting tested with a test with 0% sensitivity. And, and that's, you know, so clearly something that's high performance is gonna make a, a, a fundamental difference for those uh, individuals. And we know this from evidence already. I mean, there's evidence about cholesterol screening done opportunistically in ERs. And we know that the compliance rate is about 87 to 90 percent. That's, the, that's the, actually the best comparison we can have because there isn't a lot of screening that can be done opportunistically. There's very little actually. Cervical, maybe digital breast examinations, PSA, and then cholesterol and blood pressure. Not a lot else. And so if people are offered the opportunity very proximally to a doctor event or a health a health related event to actually have some sort of screening, they are incredibly compliant. And that is very important because in the same study they found at least five people who had undiagnosed hypercholesterolemia which could have been life limiting and i think that that's the thing we all have to keep in mind is that patients are not bought in with their feet they either don't know about it or there's just too many barriers in the way between a health event and an actual screening event that's really helpful um in terms of our poll results just so others can appreciate i think not surprisingly the majority of respondents really indicated that their motivation to be a part of any clinical trial is likely tied to a personal connection to the disease. And we see that, like you said, very similarly with rare diseases and cancer, this willingness and interest to want to be a part of what this future solutions and innovation are. I think across the board, the rest of the questions around convenience and cash and supporting scientific advancement are all pretty consistent around 10 or 15 percent. But the vast majority of our respondents feel the way that I think you know, Homie and Catherine would not be surprised by that answer that at the end of the day, you know, cancer really impacts almost every American in some way, shape or form. And this is uh, still something that really drives people's interest in wanting to be a part of the research and the science behind it. What's really interesting coming from an advocacy organization is that the personal connection to the disease we definitely see in cancer research. Actually, everybody over the age of 45, 50 has a personal connection to screening in the colorectal cancer space. And I do think that that demonstrates that trying to link those two things together, that actually this affects every single one of us personally at a particular birthday, and you can influence the future, is something that we would love to hear more from advocacy organizations about how we educate people about screening. That's great. Um, well, let's go to some questions now from the audience while we have time. I know I would hope that Jasmine, a few folks have raised their hands to ask questions of Homie and Catherine. Um, look forward to your questions. And thank you again, everyone, for the opportunity to participate in this conversation. It's been really wonderful, and we're eager to get your feedback. All right, we have a raised hand from Patricia. Go ahead and um, mute your mic so that we can hear you speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. Okay, hi. Um, I'm 71 years old, recently retired, registered nurse, uh, worked my whole career in women's health with the emphasis on breast and cervical cancer. Um, I lost my sister at the age of 48. She was diagnosed at 47. Um, her complaints to her physician for about three to four years prior were that you're married to an alcoholic, so of course you have a stomach ache. Never had a test done until she had a complete obstruction. She was three three thousand miles away, and you know I tried to encourage her and et cetera, but unfortunately she lost her battle. But she's left me with a, a real need and desire to participate. So I'm wondering if the eclipse trial is still accepting participants and since i do have regular colorectal um col colonoscopy screening would i be a candidate 
So Patricia, that's that's a horrendous story, and I think it's why everybody's here today is to to change stories like that for the people who will come in the future. And I'm I'm sorry. Um, we are still recruiting. We are about a third of the way through recruitment right now, and we're open in 120 sites across the US. Um, I'm happy to share my email address, and we could have a discussion about whether you're close enough to one of those um, and how we get you recruited. But um, even if you're not in the window of recruitment, um, we have other ways to get people involved to try and increase participation in screening in their in the community, which Eclipse can also measure as well. But happy to share my email address with you, Patricia. Thank you. Catherine, we also can mention that we have a website as well, I believe, um, around Eclipse that provides more information about the trial, um, as well as some of the site locations. It's on our website, gardenhealth.com. Looks like there's a few questions, at least uh, online too, that maybe I can just uh, quickly uh, tick off. Um, Eclipse, uh, the enrollment criteria is 45 to 84. Catherine, uh, correct me if uh, I'm wrong on any of these. I'm checking. And, um, <laughs> and it's uh, average risk uh, population. We launched uh, the trial in uh, Q4 of uh, 2019, and we expect it to enroll um, within about two years in terms of the the completion of the trial. So hopefully that ticks off, you know, a few of the, the questions that were there. We do have a uh, raised hand from Jodian. Please unmute your microphone so we can hear you speak. All right, I think you can hear me now. We yes. can. All right, uh, I was told um, by an OBGYN that the CDC uh, said that women over 65 do not have to have uh, colonoscopies, uh, pap smears, or breast cancer mammographies. I, and I assume she meant because we're old if we're over 65, I, I, unless somebody in the family has it. I mean, what's your opinion on that? So um, that's not quite the guidance. The guidance is as we get older that the decision making is less protocol driven and becomes an individual discussion between um, you and your primary care provider. Um, I can't really speak for, for mammography and cervical cancer with as much alacrity, but for colorectal cancer, that, um, that time point is about 75 actually. So the interesting thing about screening is it's all about risks and benefits and the the more interventional the procedure is the less the benefit becomes as we get older and so that's why the, colore the colonoscopy guideline um, tails off at 75 because undergoing invasive procedures uh, in our older age is a little bit more risky. Um, it's it's still important to be screened. I think as we have an aging of our population, actually 65 is the new 50, and we want to be, we are what we take into old age. And so still being screened at 65, I would say is incredibly important. Um, breast and, and cervical does change with, with risk factors over time. But I think I would double check what your doctor told you and make sure that you're pushing your PCPs when they tell you things like that to tell you what guidelines they're talking about and why on earth a healthy woman of 65 would not be screened. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Absolutely. We have a raised hand from Joshua. Please have your mic unmuted so we can hear you speak. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right, great. Uh, hello, yeah, my name is Josh Hetty. Um, I know on, on Garden 360 when it was launched, uh, it looked like it was a panel of 68 and now it's up to 74. You know, what's, um, as the NCCN guidelines adds new markers, you know, new genes to um, diagnostic capabilities, um, what's the methodology of getting those genes into the, the platform? Yeah, we've had, I think, almost a dozen upgrades to the test since we launched it in 2014. We actually, maybe people probably don't even remember this, we, I think, had 54 genes when we launched. And as you said correctly, we're, we're at 74 genes. So we're very committed to making sure that the services we offer, the products we offer, continue to keep up with guidelines. The guidelines are changing rapidly. It's great to see, you know, so many more biomarker driven therapies that are available now that are really game changing for advanced cancer patients. 
Um, and we have a commitment as a company to continue upgrading our products and trying to uh, keep up with those guidelines uh, as fast as we can. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm actually going through the uh, uh, interview process right now, so I'm hoping to um, – it's an ex exciting company you have, and I'm really hoping to get on board here shortly. Thank you for your kind word. Jasmine, do we have other questions or raised hands? I think some of the questions in the Q&A are also pretty interesting as well if we don't have other raised hands. Uh, we do not have any more raised hands. Great. I'll throw one out here from Jody. She makes a good point. How does Garden think about the need for patient navigation and support following a positive test? What is the accountability of companies like ours to develop these systems around patient navigation? So taking it in two separate parts, I think the patient navigation after a positive test is incredibly important. We know from the Trike de Benny paper of 2019 that the risk of death from CRC for a positive non-invasive test, which is not followed up by a definitive diagnostic like a colonoscopy, your risk of dying compared to a baseline person who had been followed up is about seven and a half times higher. That means that you're about through about two thirds more likely to die from your colorectal cancer if you're not followed up. So it's an incredibly important point. I think from an accountability perspective, I think all of industry, I think all of PCP and guideline committees have a role to play in this. And we all need to work together because everybody pulling in 10 different directions and garden doing their own thing and, and the Cleveland Clinic doing their own thing is not wise because that gives mixed messages. And I think this is where the industry and multi um, sponsor representation needs to happen. And I think that that is starting. We're definitely seeing these groups evolve. But I think that that sort of um, multi dimensional push towards some sort of central navigation system, which perhaps everybody could um, fund at a, 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 a partial rate would be um, game changing for those people who are really, really let down by a system that does not follow up a positive test. But I think it's also doctor education, Helmi alluded to it, and it's EMR integration. All of those things are going to work together to try to help us get people who have a positive non-invasive test to a definitive diagnostic. Can I throw in a combination of two other questions here that I think are, are interesting? One is around from Priscilla around an increase in young adults with colorectal cancer and if there are opportunities to be a part of these types of trials like Eclipse. And I think that's an answer for you, Catherine, as well as on the other side, could this type of test be used in high risk populations? Uh, yes and yes. When we started out with Eclipse, we had planned to be 50 to 84, but as Helmi mentioned, we're actually recruiting people from 45 to 84. Um, you can screen and screen and screen, um, but under the age of 40, the likelihood is that this will be more of a genetically driven rather than lifestyle or age driven disease. And so there are opportunities for the version two, the version three, the version four of Luna two post Eclipse to then be more focused on the higher risk individuals, potentially also taking the age down. So we are including 45 and to 50 year olds, despite the fact that the USPSTF guidelines have not yet been altered to include those age groups. But we believe that that age range is a very important one. Absolutely. Um, and I have one more question, and I think we touched on this a little bit during our conversation from Ray Bridgewater about how Garden is using medical mobile units to reach out to vulnerable populations around screening, testing, and treatment. Yeah, clearly with the backdrop of COVID on especially the advanced cancer population, there was a report that came out, I think, recently that um, indicated about a 30% mortality rate in advanced cancer patients uh, uh, who were infected with um, the novel coronavirus. and. Um, and so uh, a service that we've had for some time is actually mobile phlebotomy where a healthcare professional could drive to a patient's home and draw blood. Um, and that's something that we've seen um, really extensive utilization of um, during this time. And it's been something that I think has been very helpful to our customers and our, our physicians that use our test because it's able to really uh, keep those uh, at-risk populations um, really sheltered in place. and. Um, there's been an increase in telemedicine and oncology that's been tremendous. And I think that in combination with some of the virtual services we have or mobile phlebotomy that we've rolled out, uh, I think has been really helpful in terms of ensuring that those patients uh, continue to get the best possible care 
despite uh, you know the challenging backdrop that exists. Absolutely. Um, I believe, uh, Jasmine, that we're at time, but I, I'd just like to close by saying thank you. And also just to acknowledge that as developers of innovative diagnostics, you know, our priority at Garden Health is really to understand how to better incorporate the patient voice um, into our clinical development and outcomes evidence programs. And so we're, we're grateful for the opportunity to learn from you and hear from you. And please don't hesitate to reach out and follow up with us. But thank you again to Prevent Cancer. And thank you again to Helmi and Catherine for participating in the conversation today. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, it's my pleasure.